Okay, so my presentation, Thirst for Knowledge, uh, factors to consider in selecting a reusable uh, water bottle. Um, we've seen from Bob how valuable uh, standard plastic water bottles can be under certain circumstances where they are saving people's lives. And uh, many people today in, in North America are using reusable water bottles and they have questions about many aspects of these bottles and I want to address some of these, some of these today. So the fundamental question is, are we drinking water from the tap or are we going to choose a bottle of water that's shipped halfway around the world? And uh, this is a question that many of us um, are dealing with. So what I want to do today, just a little bit of background about myself, some studies that we've done in the past. This is familiar to many of you, so I will do this very quickly. And just to remind you about the analyses that have been done in the groundwaters of the area. And then a little bit of background about bottled water's advantages and disadvantages uh, with bottled water. I think if I was in Uganda, uh, I would be very grateful for a bottle of water. And then the reusable waters, uh, water bottles, some pros and cons, advantages and disadvantages. So the reusable water bottles that I'll talk about today, basically three kinds, uh, plastic bottles, and some people have been using, they're quite popular, polycarbonate bottles. But of course, polycarbonate contains BPA, which some people are concerned of, and I'll say a few words about that. And polypropylene bottles, that's the type of bottle that we were giving out today at our event. The stainless steel bottle from Clean Canteen. And then the SIG bottles, which we also had today. So I also want to point out <clears throat> in the first half of my presentation some information about bottled waters, uh, facts and misconceptions. One is health benefits of bottled waters, chemical composition of the water, contamination from packaging, environmental impacts, direct environmental impacts, and also indirect environmental impacts. And finally, the costs. And as I said, I'll do this just simply as background. So uh, many of you know I'm originally from Toronto, and my day job is at the University of Heidelberg in Germany, where I have a clean laboratory and we use that laboratory for measuring trace metal concentrations at very low, very low levels. The laboratory is very well equipped and we can measure trace metals to extraordinarily low concentrations. Most of that work is done to test ice cores from the Arctic. Ice cores are incredible um, archives. We do this work together with the Geological Survey of Canada. James Zhang, who recently did his PhD, uh, at the University of Heidelberg on metals in ice cores. So again, the main interest in the clean lab was to study ice cores as records of global metal pollution. And the work on, on, on groundwater started really as a curiosity. So I want to remind you that if we go drilling down through the ice caps in the Arctic and we go back in time thousands of years, that the lead concentrations in the cleanest layers of ancient Arctic ice on the order of five parts per trillion. So these are among then the lowest lead concentrations that have ever been measured at the surface of the earth and we consider this the cleanest, cleanest water on earth. Okay, a part per trillion, if we think about Lake Huron with a trillion liters, adding one more liter would be equivalent to a part per trillion. So part per trillion, extremely low concentration. And in this area of Ontario, centered around the Elmville area, a lot of artesian flows where water is literally bubbling out of the ground. And if you remember that the cleanest ice layers have approximately five parts per trillion of lead, um, the average groundwater also, and some of the groundwater below one part per trillion. So again, these are the really the lowest concentrations of lead that have ever been measured in waters at the surface of the earth. Um, we measure many, many other trace metals, but I won't be talking about them today, but we find similar results for trace metals. 
I've also been up in the area collecting snow samples. If you see somebody running around in the winter with bright orange clothing, digging snow pits, it's probably me. And I've tested the snow also, and when we compare the snow and the groundwater, the groundwater is much, much cleaner in the case of lead by a factor of a hundred times because of the filtration by the soils. So it shows us how Mother Nature is filtering waters as they percolate through the soil. So it's a fascinating area. And the metal concentrations are, are so low that it's very difficult to find any data for comparison, and that's why we started looking at bottled waters. And of course, the bottled waters, um, we have the impression that they're, they're, they're good for us. They're certainly very, very popular. Well, I grew up in Toronto, and I worked part-time at a Dominion store. And uh, at that time in Toronto, at the Dominion store, in the, in, the, in, the, in the store, there was one brand of bottled water being sold from France in these little green bottles. And I couldn't help but notice that nobody bought it. And I'd always wondered who would buy a bottle of water. But if we go to the supermarket today, it looks rather different. So something has definitely changed. Well, this is a recent report that just appeared in Ontario Nature about water removal. And I just want to point out here Aquafina um, being sold for, on average, approximately $2 a liter. They indicate in this article that um, bottled water typically costs approximately a thousand times more than tap water. So it's much more expensive um, than uh, getting uh, water out of the tap, but that Health Canada has added there is no evidence that there's a health benefit from bottled water. But I want to point out also that Nestle taking groundwater here in southern Ontario, they pay approximately $3 for a million liters of water. Okay, so it's very inexpensive for the bottling companies, but it's very inexpensive inexpe for, the, for the consumer. Now, bottled water has been called immoral, but of course I'm not going to deal with any of the, the moral aspects uh, McLean's magazine recently bottled water the latest environmental sin. Uh, Tony Clark is the expert on this area from the Polaris Institute. He gave a talk last year at the Elmville Water Festival. This is his book, Inside the Bottle, and his presentation is on our website. If you weren't here last year, you can download that um, from the internet and view it on our, our website. Uh, but what I wanted to point out to you is if we look at the chemical composition of bottled waters, here's a study published 20 years ago. They tested 37 brands of bottled water in the United States, and 24 of them had one or more parameters that didn't meet the normal drinking water guidelines. So this isn't new, this is published 20 years ago, and uh, so we've always known that some of the bottled waters don't meet normal drinking water guidelines. Well, what about the World Health Organization? Um, in their uh, article, Potential Health Benefits of Bottled Drinking Water, okay, just to emphasize here for you what they have found, there is no scientific information on the health benefits or hazards of regularly drinking bottled waters. So in other words, there is no scientific data to suggest that these waters are better for our health. And a book that was just published, Bottle Mania, here's a review in the Toronto Star approximately a week ago, and they call this the greatest marketing coup of the 20th and 21st centuries. When people are spending up to 10,000 times more money on bottled water than on tap, wa tap water when in the United States 90% of the water, the tap water meets all of the drinking water guidelines. So one of the aspects that I've been dealing with is contamination of bottled waters from leaching from the containers. This is work of course that we do in Heidelberg in Germany. Most of these bottled waters 
are packaged in polyethylene terephthalate, or PET, and PET is all manufactured using antimony trioxide as a catalyst, and uh, the bottles contain hundreds of parts per million of antimony. It's a potentially toxic metal which then leaches into the water. And the bottled waters typically contain concentrations hundreds to thousands of times higher than what naturally appears in the, in the water. So we've done a study <clears throat> of 132 brands of bottled water from 28 countries, and these are the antimony concentrations in parts per trillion. So it's a logarithmic scale, one part per trillion, 10, 100, 1,000, and some of the bottled waters are more than 2,000 parts per trillion, okay? And here's our groundwater in this area, two parts per trillion. So you can see from this graph that the groundwater in this area with respect to this parameter antimony is cleaner than any of the bottled waters tested from all, from all around the world. And 2,000 parts per trillion is two parts per billion. The Health Canada guideline is six parts per billion. I want to emphasize that all of the bottled waters are below the drinking water guideline. But it certainly takes away a little bit of the image of these bottled waters representing the most pure form uh, of water. Now, <clears throat> some of the more expensive bottled waters are in glass. We also looked at bottled waters in glass. Here's lead in parts per trillion. This is a brand of bottled water. And here is our lead concentrations from six different bottles, extremely, really, extremely low when they're in plastic bottles. But that same bottled water in glass, now you have hundreds of parts per trillion of lead in the bottled water because of leaching from glass. Okay, the minerals used to make glass contain lead, so there's lead leaching from the glass. So in fact, these expensive bottled waters in glass contain lead concentrations that are comparable to tap water. But I want you to also know that the bottled waters vary in chemical composition. So we've just finished a study where we've looked at all of the metals that are listed here. So all of the bottled waters that we've tested from around the world, we've measured also for, for these parameters. And I want to point out that in the case of uranium, okay, which is not a metal that we think about typically every day, there's a bottled water from Finland that exceeds the drinking water guideline for uranium. So the drinking water guideline is 20 parts per billion, but the bottled water from Finland contains more uranium than that. In other words, it doesn't meet the drinking water guideline. So uranium concentrations in bottled waters hugely variable depending on the geology of the source area. And if you buy a bottle of water, you might not know how much it, uranium it contains. And the same is true of lithium, okay? Lithium concentrations hugely variable from 50 parts per trillion to five parts per million, okay? But five parts per million of lithium is a relatively high concentration. Lithium is also an element that's used in the form of lithium carbonate to treat uh, depression, where they look at getting a blood plasma lithium concentration between 5 and 8 milligrams per, per liter. So some of these bottled waters are high in lithium, okay. Um, some of them are high in beryllium. Uh, some of the beryllium concentrations I exceed the guideline from the US EPA. Bottled waters from France, Germany, and Yugoslavia, for example. So my point here is if you buy a bottled water, do you know what's actually in that water? So this has nothing to do with leaching from the bottles. This is actually what's actually inside the water naturally because of differences in geology at the surface of the earth. And finally, this is an article. Um, for those of you who don't speak German, I apologize. It's a Swiss consumer's magazine that tested bottled waters in Switzerland and they looked at a couple of different parameters. Out of the 15 brands of bottled water in Switzerland, six were considered good based on this testing. Six were only adequate, and three were considered inadequate based on uranium and acid aldehyde. 
Okay, so here's a summary of their results. Drinking water guideline for uranium, 20 parts per billion. The guideline for acetaldehyde is 15 parts per billion. But beyond that, it affects the taste of the water. It's not a health concern, it's an aesthetic parameter that affects the taste of the water, but because of leaching from the plastic, it's affecting the taste of the, the water. And this is what acetaldehyde looks like. <clears throat> it occurs naturally in ripe fruit and coffee and fresh bread. It's produced by plants, known as the chemical that causes hangovers. But I just wanted to point out to you that there may be more leaching from the plastic than just the, just the antimony. So this is a summary in uh, <clears throat> a Canadian magazine and one of the directors of the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. We know what's in tap water and depending on the, what the source of the bottled water is and what leaches from the plastic containers, I think we sometimes know less about what's in bottled water. Environmental impacts of bottled water, there's the obvious direct environmental impacts. Maud Barlow has mentioned this about uh, groundwater uh, table drawdown when water is removed excessively from, from groundwaters, and obviously the waste when these bottles are not being recycled. But I want you to think about some of the indirect environmental impacts of bottled water the Pacific Institute in, in, in California did a calculation. If you take into account not only the fossil fuel to make the plastic, but also to transport the water, it amounts to approximately a quarter of a liter per liter of water. Okay, so when you think about a bottle of water, think about the amount of fossil fuel that's gone in to create that bottle and to ship it in some cases halfway around the world. So is there really an environmentally friendly bottled water? This is a bottle, also from Canada, and it's biodegradable. But the main issue is not only the plastic, it's the transportation. What are the consequences of transportation? I put together here a quick list. When you're delivering bottles of water by transport truck, because of the carbon emissions, you're con con uh, contributing to global climate change, acidification of the oceans, nitrogen oxide emissions, acid rain and photochemical smog, emissions of particulate matter, a, a number of heavy metals, platinum group metals, lead, zinc, antimony, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a number of indirect environmental consequences of drinking and buying and transporting and shipping bottled water. That's a bottle that I found last summer, Prince Edward Island. It's not a staged photograph. Okay, so to summarize the, the, the cons uh, with bottled water, it's expensive, it's not healthier, there's direct environmental impacts, there's indirect environmental impacts, there's a variable chemical composition, there's leaching from the containers, antimony, lead, acid, aldehyde. So this gets us back to thinking again about tap water and the importance of tap water. This is an ad from the City of Toronto. City of Toronto has excellent water. I told you I'm from Toronto originally. I grew up in Toronto. The water in Toronto is excellent. Um, in the City of New York, they realized also that they have excellent tap water and some municipalities are beginning to realize that in fact they've got excellent municipal water. Health Canada has guidelines, drinking water quality parameters, it's 16 pages long, so the message that I wanted to let you know about is the regulation and the regular analysis of, of tap water. In Toronto, for example, a summary of their analyses from 2006, if we look at E. coli, for example, 11,000 samples that year, okay? In fact, this sheet of this is a list of all of the chemical parameters that they measure. It's nine pages long. Okay, so the tap water is exhaustively tested. So this brings some people back to reusable water bottles and which water bottle is, is, is the best to use. Well, I want to bring your attention to National Geographic. They have something they call the Green Guide. And in this issue, they have a summary 
for consumers about selecting plastics. And they go through and explain what all of these numbers mean and uh, to help the consumer identify these things, even a shopper's card. And I point out here that polypropylene, which is, for example, our EnviroClear bottle, number five, is considered one of the safe plastics which can also be recycled. Everybody's familiar with Tupperware and that's the same plastic as made using uh, Tupperware. Many people have bought polycarbonate bottles. This is a typical polycarbonate bottle. Um, one uh, problem with polycarbonate bottles is bisphenol A and this was a study that was published. The release of bisphenol A um, into water at room temperature. And this caused some concern uh, followed by a study about the effect of bisphenol A on the development of brains in, in mice. So um, as of April of this year, American Chemical Society, which is the largest scientific society, their uh, weekly news magazine, the headline in April, April 2nd, Bisphenol is called mainly safe. Um, by the end of April, momentum building against bisphenol A in Canada uh, proposed a ban on polycarbonate in baby bottles. And the concern was specifically for uh, um, exposure to, uh, to infants. And, uh, and the Canadian decision, the argument was essentially be safe rather than be sorry. By June, the same magazine, these are all reports from the same magazine, bisphenol A under scrutiny, and uh, now finally the latest information that I could get for you in June, uh, the Food and Drug Administration now is going to review all of the science on bisphenol A. So that's why the concern about the polycarbonate bottles, Mountain Equipment Co-op for example, uh, for these very reasons, took their bottles off the shelf. So the polypropylene bottle, as I said, this is the EnviroClear bottle and this number four plastic, which again the green guy said was, was safe. It contains no bisphenol A. This information uh, provided, of course, by Container Corp, our sponsor that pr 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 uh, provided the bottles, and also that these are dishwasher safe and that these are recyclable. And as far as antimony is concerned, when we tested bottled waters from all around the world, there was only one in polypropylene, or sorry, there was only one in polypropylene and there was only one bottle that didn't leach antimony and it was a polypropylene, polypropylene bottle. Now we also have for our volunteers to thank our volunteers for all their help, they all got a stainless steel bottle or a SIG bottle. Okay, so we did a small leaching test in, in Germany. I thought if we're providing these bottles for our volunteers, we want to also include these in their studies. So we looked at this clean canteen stainless steel bottle, which is made in China. And in Germany, this company makes a stainless steel bottle, but it's manufactured in China. The SIG bottle is aluminum, but it has a proprietary liner. And we also looked at a stainless steel hip flask and also a pewter, pewter hip flask. Pewter is an antimony tin alloy and I simply wanted to look at the antimony leaching from the pewter. So these are lead concentrations, again in parts per trillion. Our control is deionized water in the lab. It's extremely clean deionized water in an extremely clean laboratory. And you see the SIG bottle is, is not much different from the deionized water and there's a small difference between the two steels which reflects different kinds of steels used to manufacture the bottles. But I want to point out to you that all of these concentrations are much lower than the bottled waters in glass. And this leaching study was done in deionized water so if somebody is filling up their stainless steel bottle with tap water, they're never going to be, uh, there's never going to be any significant leaching of the stainless steel relative to the amount that's already in the, in the, in the tap water. So these values extremely, 
extremely low. And then antimony, a metal that you heard me talk a lot about, again, our deionized water extremely low, and then our SIG bottles slightly, slightly higher, but again, it, we're talking values so low that we're the only lab that could make these measurements, a difference between the steels, and of course the pewter, the pewter flask, not only very high antimony, but also very high thallium concentrations, okay? So don't buy a, a pewter hip flask and, and use it for your alcoholic beverages. That's, that's how I see it. Now chrome, of course there's leaching of chrome from the stainless steel bottles. There has to be leaching of chrome from stainless steel, but again, these are very, very low values. And they're, they're going to be lower than the tap water used to fill the bottle. And again, the SIG, SIG bottles, again, not much different from our control. Okay, Air Canada magazine, they came out with a recommendation on the clean canteen and also on the SIG bottles. And again, um, to thank our volunteers, each of our volunteers got either a clean canteen or a SIG, which were donated to our event. And also, uh, uh, thumbs up from Green Living magazine. So to summarize, <clears throat> Polypropylene, non-toxic, and by that I mean it doesn't leach bisphenol A, it doesn't leach metals, it's dishwasher safe, easy to recycle, and it's inexpensive. Stainless steel, also non-toxic because the leaching of the metals are extremely low. It's robust, it's dishwasher safe, it's a little bit more expensive. And then the Rolls-Royce, the Swiss bottle, again, non-toxic, Okay, no leaching of metals, and also no BPA. That's information provided to me by the, the, the company. Robust, dishwasher safe, more expensive. Okay, my daughters were born in Switzerland. They grew up using SIG bottles. Uh, they're very, very common in Switzerland. Uh, I have a SIG bottle, a clean canteen bottle. We know the three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle. Uh, we can add a couple more reusable bottles, rinse them, refill them, refresh yourself. And again, it's just common sense that we don't leave water in the bottles for a long period of time. We rinse them, and then leaching from any bottle is going to be minimal, especially either at room temperature or if you keep them in the fridge uh, overnight. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>